You want to do it? Let's do it. Okay. How do you want me to? How how do you want me to? I mean, I'm gonna. I got to put all your titles on the screen. I got to put them all on there because there's so many of them. Well, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna be touching in upon stuff we don't know. So the SRICF is out. Oh, what do you mean? We can we can put the title in there. We don't have to talk about it, but we can put it on there. Right? Okay, yeah. we can put it we can put it on there. Okay. So we'll just start it off by welcoming the Robert Lee Franks the third. Um, you know, I, I I couldn't even I couldn't even go through all your titles. Robbie, Ro affectionately known to me as Robbie, Robbie oh, and I please, have been. Let's keep it. Let's keep it cordial. Oh, okay, okay. Well, yeah. we'll we'll put them on the bottom of the screen and we'll scroll it. We'll have a loop of all your uh, all your titles. You know, I'm just a brother to you, brother. Hey, cheers, brother. This is to you. Thank you for doing you. this. You and your your first guest on your on your show. The first the first guest on on the show. It's going to be great. It, uh, Many, many to come. Charlatan in the shadows, long awaited, most anticipated. We're talking about the man, the myth, I guess. He's not a legend in my mind, but... Uh, Some people's mind. I guess. And <laughs> that's a good way to start it. Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley is a man. Um, I mean, Robbie, you know, I, I think I would like to call you, know, you a... I don't want to say historian. I want to say a, um, a, uh, I don't know. How would you describe your, uh, your, uh, anti Crowley, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's perfect. I think that's perfect. The way to say it, we just put it right out there. No. Yeah, totally. And, um, I think all of us were, uh, you know, um, uh, exposed to Crowley at some point or another, maybe through, you know, modern music or myth or, or legend or whatever, but, um, you and I actually, you know, we're brothers. Um, we're Freemasons. We're Rosicrucians. Where we uh, are involved in a lot of the same uh, organizations together, and we've had a little bit of a different exposure to the guy. Um, and you know, you and I have had these many conversations over many times, and with other brothers, um, to varying degrees of their affinity for the man. And I, I, and you and I thought it was a good time to come out and do this in a way that um, can put the story out there in a way that we understand understand it in the way you understand it and I understand it and I, I you know want to give you that platform and I want to be able to have this conversation be fluid and no holds barred no holding back I mean obviously we can't share any of the um, you know the secrets so to speak that that we um, that we took oaths on but other than that I think we can we can have an educated lively discussion on this man and your knowledge of him and, and my uh, uh, take on it so by all means, what is this guy, and why the hell do we care? Why? Well, that's a great that's a great first question, John. You know how I kind of got into Crowley is this in the study of the occult and hermeticism and esoteric knowledge. It's kind of hard to miss this man. I mean, literally, you could swing a dead cat any way that cat would go. You're going to bump into a little bit of Crowley in this. You know, why is that? Is my question. Is it because he was tapped into another plane of existence where he was getting messages from entities like interdimensional beings, or dare we even say gods? Could it just be that he was so enriched in all these rituals that in drugs that he was elevating his mind to another existence where he could communicate and bring these secrets and powers back to uh, our realm and this sacred knowledge or was he a charlatan that was able that was that had enough money to back him to promote himself enough being an upper uh class uh, uh british um gentleman who was able to live on his money and be able to market himself so well where he was able to get into all these different societies and uh, leave his mark or abuse these uh, opportunities that he had to make a name for himself. I leave mean, I his, leave his stain, right? That'd be another way to put definitely, it. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. You know, yeah. but to understand who Crowley is, we got to understand how he, how he, uh, how he grew up, right. where he came from. Right. Yeah, totally. So I'm not going to bore your audience, your audience 
definitely got the internet and there is a lot of publications and there's a lot of um, shows and different media platforms that just talk about Crowley to the point of agnosium, which mm-hmm. means to the point of throwing up. Right. The thing about Crowley that we definitely know was he was born as Edward Alistair Crowley into an upper class uh, um, English uh, family. And his family made their money off of their Crowley ale. Right. It was, bo- it was beer, right? Is it, beer? Yeah. it was like a beer? Yeah. So, yeah. Right. It was uh, 1800s, right? Like late, late 1800s. Yeah, like late mid, 1800s. Mid late yeah. 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. Like toward the latter half of the 1800s. I don't right. have any facts statistic. Right. Right. And, uh, or date. And um, he grew up with his father and his family a part of a religion called the Plymouth Brethren, which was kind of a radical Christian sect. Was that yeah. the? Does that have any relation to the Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Rock, like Plymouth in America? Like, was this the same kind of religious sect that came from England over to to found America, like pre you know sixteen hundreds, like left persecution from England that came here, or is that a different sect? No, I don't believe. From what I've gathered, it's not. It's not that same thing. Okay. No, it was just a Christian sect. You know, I think it was um, as I did some history on it, it was um, broken off from like the Church of England. Okay, so it was just a splinter from the Church of England, and we're like, yeah. we're going to do our own thing. But it was very, very strict rule of law kind strict of religion. Strict rule of right? law. Right. We're not celebrating holidays. We're right. not getting gifts for you. You should right. be repenting in any kind of enjoyment in, in, in Life. anything. Life. In any, anything. Right. Literally, right. anything you find enjoyment. Great food. Toys, the sunshine, <laughs> any of that right, was right. considered a sin. Right. And his father, and I believe one of the big things about which is ironic about them, because they were, um, I want to say they were Quake. I want to say they were Quakers before. Were they Quakers? Don't quote me on that. But uh, before his father joined the Plymouth Brethren, mm-hmm. they, uh, you know, they wouldn't drink. Even though they had a crowd, even though that's where they made their money, which is funny, they they have a they have a brewery and they don't drink, but exactly, muzzle top, <laughs> yeah, <muzzle> top. <laughs> so, and his father became so enthralled, and his mom became so enthralled in this church that uh, his father would go preach the Bible all around, mm-hmm. and young Alice, young Edward at the time, was able to join his father. And some uh, in some cited sources, we see that his fa- that he adored his father and he loved his father. And some people have claimed that you know his father was abusive. Mm. You know, which might play into some uh, psychological effects later. But what we definitely know is he loved his father and he threw himself because he wanted to be like his dad, as most young men like to, into this church. At a, year, at a very young age, just at getting towed it around, just preaching this hardcore version of of religion, Plymouth, bl- yep. brother, and um, basically the, he, that's what all trying I'm, to convert people, trying to convert people, trying to get them to to do the strict rule of law, you know, which is hard to do. I mean, like you're going to try to show up and tell me that I'm not I'm supposed to like anything, <laughs> enjoy anything, yeah, and, and this is the guy that has a brewery, and uh, and this is the guy telling me. Not to drink, you know. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of. Uh, I believe you know, there's a Quaker background with his grandfather, and his his father found the way into the Plymouth Brethren, and his and his mother was a radical too. Okay. Where uh, who he resented, but we'll get into that later on in the conversation. Right, right, right. And uh, what we also saw, and um, I've read in some books that. Alistair also saw inside the Plymouth Brethren that his father wasn't as respected, even though his father threw himself into this religion and he's going around preaching. The rest of the congregation didn't respect him. And he's I, all in because he's he's the beer guy, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that he they they knew he you know it's I think like most things it's a little bit political. Oh yeah, right, right? in the mm-hmm. church, just like in uh, various other things in our lives. Yeah. And Alistair, sorry, my cat's trying to play with my wires. Right no, br- bring him over. <laughs> so with that, you see Alistair already getting a little seeds of doubt planted. In. 
Yeah. O- over the course of time, his father dies, ironically, of tongue cancer. Really? Yeah, tongue cancer, which is kind of funny because he goes around and he spits the Bible. He's preaching. And he's preaching, and he's trying to convert, and ironically, he gets tongue cancer. Now, I am kind of want to head some bets here. Since we only got Crowley that's saying this. And then that's a good, that's a really great point. And we've talked about this before. I mean, in the majority, I would say what, like 98% of everything or more. I I don't know. I don't give a percent. I mean, just a very large percentage of the material that we have is based, it is just out of Crowley's mouth, his hands, his his written. He's writing this down. He's making up his story as he goes. Yeah, I think he's, I think what you're going to notice if anybody dives into the life of Aleister Crowley is that Crowley, even in his diaries, took creative liberties. And I think he liked to be, quote unquote, tongue in cheek with some of the ways that he wrote and uh, in his poetry. Mm -hmm. And what I'm what I'm getting to at is here is that I believe Aleister Crowley took this opportunity because he's writing this as an older gentleman at Mm -hmm. the time that he looked back at his life and he's like, well, how ironic could it be in my life to see that my father died of tongue cancer, mm-hmm. even though he was preaching the Bible every day at the breakfast table, even though he was going around and he threw his whole life into this. Mm-hmm. So what we know is Crowley's father dies. And then after Crowley's father dies, he starts acting like any any uh, son would, just starts acting very depressed, he's upset. He's sickly because of the way the diet structure was in the Plymouth Brethren, where, you know, like I said, you're not in, you're not enjoying. It's not like me. You, right. know, you know, you're not just eating to your fullest. You know, you're eating <laughs> the minimum and you're not enjoying it. And who knows what you're eating. Right. And with that, he was he a very sick. sickly boy. He got sick. He was right. a very depressed boy because he lost his father. Was he like and 10 or something like that? I can't remember how old he was. I think it was 10 or 12, 10 something or 12. like that. Yeah, he was right. 14. I'm yeah. sure one of your viewers will definitely yeah. pick that from us. Yeah. So what else we find out is he starts acting erratic. He starts mm-hmm. rebelling against his father or his mother at the time. Right. Who uh, nicknames him the B666. Right. You know, and I think he took great pride in that because he becomes a character. Right. Life. He's... He's now, it's to him, it's justifying him as a true monster. Right. Beast. Right. You know, right. and I think, I think uh, other people were kind of drawn to that later on as he keeps being more and more and more crazy. Yeah. And I mean, and there was a lot of, yeah, there was a lot of that too. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I, you know, what I, I dove into a little bit with you and we talked about it was like, you know, he got sick, he got real sick. His uncle was like, Hey, the kid just needs to go outside. He takes him yeah. outside. And like, he, you know, he's like, Oh, well, he needs fresh air and food and you know, all this stuff. And he, his uncle kind of, um, takes him under his wing and kind of gives him a different, um, lifestyle than he had been living. Right. So he's not living yeah. under this, this rule of thumb, this, per, this, um, yeah. this very oh. regimented thing. His, his uncle wasn't into that at all. I don't think his, no. his uncle, his was uncle wasn't into it at all. He yeah. got him into gambling. He got right. him he, into, he bought him a, a hooker. He brought him a prostitute. He brought him a hooker. Yeah. He yeah. make him lose his virginity at 15. Yeah. Uh, all of know. these things he had, like, it was just completely like 360 from what he was doing in his life. Imagine growing up in a strict religious family with so many dogmatic rules that you have to follow <laughs> and then to just now just being so when he was sick like you said yeah he, his uncle says he just needs to get some fresh air let him come and live with me and i'm you know if he's gonna die he might as well enjoy life yeah because they, that was uncle. the thing they said he's gonna die he's just not gonna make it like and there's the yeah. doctors are like eh, he's just gonna die. and he's and he's a cool uncle and he just wants to say look hey i'm gonna make you live like you know like he's gonna die. We might as well get him some hookers. We'll get him some booze. We'll get him some get whatever him some he wants. Booze, right? Get him some food. Get him out there climbing trees. You know, yeah, having you know having a good time. And he has a rapid turnaround. Yeah, he, he's, think, he's healed. I mean, he's not dying anymore. He's definitely not dying. He's now understand that he can live and enjoy a freedom. Right. And he goes back to his parents or to his mom at the time, and still is acting erratic. And he found this new joy of, hey, I can actually be outside this comfort zone and he starts then having those problems with the Plymouth brethren. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's where it starts uh, getting into his mind about religion as well. And about, about the restrictions that comes with religion. 
Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. And then just the, the dichotomy of the whole thing. Right. So it's like you go from one extreme to pretty much to the other times a billion. Right. You take it from, you take it from this hardcore, very strict sect of, of this religion. Like you said, you can't even eat, <laughs> you know, you can't even enjoy anything in your life to like, just do whatever the hell you want. And that just, and, and then plus with the depression and, and the loss of your father and, you know, all these other things. And, you know, as a teen, you're already going through all this angst and all those other things anyway. So it just turns you into the spiral, you know, I mean, all of us have gone through it. I remember wearing black t-shirts every day for, you know, years and, you know, and, and you know, just living that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it, he took it to the degree where, um, you know, honestly, we can say most people never did. I mean, if they did, it wasn't, you know, he had the wherewithal to document it and make himself this giant thing in his own mind through all of his, his, his research or, or all of his writings. And, um, you know, he wouldn't have been able to do that if he wasn't this trust fund baby, because literally that's what he was, right? He was a trust fund baby from the, from the Crowley Ale, right? Is that, I mean, yep. I'm sorry to steal your thunder. I'm just kind of, no, please. no, no, I think so. So he was, so he had a bunch of money and at that time it was a lot of money. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's, this is, this is like, fuck you money right now. This is like, yeah. I'm just going to do what much. I want. I'm going to do what I, wherever the hell I want. And as a kid, you know, I think he got sent off to boarding school. His mom was like, get out of here. He got mom went to, yeah. He went to boarding school. Right. He kind of found out that, uh, he, I think, I believe he went to an all boys school mm. and he found out that he was a homosexual with, uh, because he was messing with one of the drama, one of the drama students that he fell in love with and he started writing poetry for. And during that Victorian age... Where, At an early age. We're talking like 15, 16... 15, 16, 17. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're seeing we're seeing another restriction in religion at that time right. where, hey, what do you mean I can't like this guy? Right. Who are you to tell me I can't like this guy? Right. This authoritiveness that comes with religion. Mm -hmm. And again, he liked the more eccentric, I want to do what I want to do. And I think, again, more seeds, more, you know, it's starting to grow inside of him. So he yeah. goes to Cambridge, he goes to become the phenomenal chess player. Yeah. Cambridge. Which is, you know, which is something that, one of the things I didn't realize. I mean, yeah. of course. I mean, what else are you going to do? And then <laughs> Cambridge, got, play chess. There's there's conflicting uh, evidence that, you know, he did graduate, he didn't graduate, and but he does get one thing for certain, a large sum of money mm -hmm. from Crowley Ale. Right. And during that age of the late 1800s, you're in that realm of the spiritualist movement. Yeah, where, I mean, you think you put it in context. I mean, a lot of people don't, you know, like yeah, younger than us, maybe older than us, but uh, people hate history. You know, but, but you put it in the context of the late 1800s. I mean, we're talking about the height, the peak of Industrial Revolution. We're talking about tra intercontinental travel. We're talking about ships that you can get on and you can, it's a long ass time. But if you if you want to get on a ship in England and you want to go to Spain or, or, or America or Australia or... It's a trip. Yeah, it's a trip. It's going to be months. It's going to be hard. It's going to, you know, it's going to be rough. You're going to be able to do it. But I mean, that's the kind of thing. There's trains that can take you, you know, a big thing. You can get places if you have enough money. I mean, literally just big trunks of stuff and you're paying people to carry it with you. And like all those things you see in those old movies, like that was a real thing. If you had the money, you could do those things. And at that time, there was a lot of unexplored um, historical sites or areas of things like that that were just kind of like, uh, you know, touristy, uh, you know, things for then, but, you know, a few people had written about, but, you know, at that time, not a lot of people had that kind of money, but, it, but, it, but, uh, the age of that late 1800s, early 1900s was like the peak time to be able to, I think it was the only time in history that you could actually do that. You'd be like, Hey, screw it. I'm going to, I want to go to Egypt. And then that could happen for you, right? In a, in an easier manner than any other form in history. So I just kind of wanted well, to throw that out there that like now was that's the kind of time frame we're talking about where you can make that happen, right? Yeah, if you got money, it opens a lot of doors. Of course, even now. But then, it, but then it was your money went more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely went way farther. Way farther. You know? right. Yeah. You know, you got these. What this is where the secret societies and the mystery schools are in from back in the day right. in the ancient times where people are now let's get into a next let's get into the next level of spirituality right and if you had money and you were an upper class person your able your checkbook was able to get you into those places on a friday night doing a seance or getting into these societies and being initiated into these brother and sisterhoods of some of these societies and co-ed societies and he gets I mean, what a fascinating time, by the way. Yeah, 
be yeah. around poets and and scientists, authors, and, right? Yeah, and all this low life, high life, and you're just in these think tanks of maybe this is maybe this is how we can pierce the veil, right? You know, and with Alistair, he was able he changed his name in college, and he was able to move along and. He bumped into a gentleman who introduced him into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was started by Samuel Lindell McGregor Mathers, who was a Freemason. And it was an, supposed to be an offshoot of uh, Rosicrucianism. And there's two orders. There's an inner order, or an outer order, and an inner order. And, and they go by grades instead of degrees, like what we would know in Masonic terminology. Mm-hmm. Right. They went by precise grades with ritualistic incantations and whatnot. Right. And with that, he, (laughs) the one thing you first start noticing about Crowley is he starts assuming these many different identities. Right. And I think you find that a lot in cult leaders where they need to become an enigma. They need to become that shock value kind of charisma leader or person that don't know me from my past. I'm this person. And it adds a little bit of mysteria, mysteria to it. Mm-hmm. It adds a little bit of, you know, a lot of people like to follow those eccentric kind of leaders. And he um, calls himself some Russian aristocrat with a right. really bad Russian accent and a fake mustache. Yeah, and he and, like sneaks in one of these Golden Dawn meetings and tries to like present himself as a Russian ar- aristocrat. Yeah, and, uh, like uh, Vladimir little... Voskov or something like that. Starkov yeah, and everybody's just kind of like, this dude is full of shit right off the bat. Basically. Oh, right off the bat. Yeah. W.D. Yeats couldn't stand him, you know, the great right. poet. You know, I mean, this the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, you were able to meet W.B. Yeats and, you know, Arthur Cannon Doyle and stuff like that, you know, um, I want to say Mary Bram Stoker, not Mary Bram Stoker. Bram yeah. Stoker was in these organizations, right. and right, right, just to oh, just, yeah, oh yeah. So like that's there's one something I want to point out. So like the the founder was a Mason, and uh, obviously a lot of the tenets of of, of Freemasonry um, didn't transfer over over to the Golden Dawn, obviously because it was a new way of thing. He he was just a Mason, and, and he you know kind of started to do his own thing, but um, you know. In masonry, uh, just to point out for people that don't know or, or don't or, or you know maybe maybe not so well informed is that uh, in masonry you know it, there's no um, dividing line. You know we talked about Crowley coming from money and basically you you know like you were saying in the Victorian time you can you write your check and you hey I'm going to show up and I'm going to be part of this thing or I'm going to be part of but but in masonry even now and today and even then it didn't matter where you came from as far as the the money came from right you could be the pauper on the street or you could be the prince and as long as somebody vouched for you and you know you, you um met the obligations that uh, yep. freemasonry you yep. were allowed in and you were treated as an equal right and that's yep. how it is today be, right yeah you had to be true to your values you had to believe in a higher power to believe in a higher power right freemasonry does not accept uh, atheist. atheist, right, right, you know, right. because when you take an obligation, you don't have to fear the repercussion of the brethren coming after you. Right, you have to fear breaking that oath with your with your God. Right, your, right. Your, yeah, and that's right. one thing that's great about the fraternity because it doesn't matter, you know, when if you're a custodial worker or a Fortune 500 executive, you're right there together. Right. Yep. Totally. So and that's how that's how yeah. it is still. You know, and that's how it was then. You know, and but but but. Crowley, I want to say, uh, uh, he wasn't a Mason. Crowley was no. not a Freemason. Never. Crowley there was is, never a Freemason. No, I wanted to debunk this on your show. There is no <laughs> record. So we're going to take, we're going to jump forward a little bit and go mm-hmm. back mm-hmm. to the, to the Hermetic Order. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. Does. I just wanted, I just wanted to make that yeah. a, a blatantly obvious that this guy was never a Freemason. So when he was traveling around the world, he mm-hmm. goes to Mexico. And apparently, either as he was climbing or when he was with somebody that was a supposed Freemason, was some Mexican gentleman. Right. And he apparently exclaimed some kind of hidden word or sacred word of either 33rd. And allegedly, he was made a 33rd or a Freemason on site. Right. There is no records of, of Aleister Crowley in any lodge. That is total false. Right. Now... Did he hang around people who were part of the fraternity? Absolutely. Sure. Theodore Roos of the OTO. Right. Um, 
uh, was a Freemason. Uh, Samuel and Del McGregor Mathers was a Freemason. I mean, Freemason was a pretty prominent society back in the day. Yeah. And, you, you know, couldn't throw a rock. <laughs> yeah, literally. Freemasons, yeah, everybody you just couldn't was a member. Do, right, of, you just couldn't do it. Yeah. Back in those days. Right, totally. You know, and so, yeah, there's no record of him ever being a Freemason, even though he was self-proclaimed as a Freemason. Yeah, no, totally. And, and I think that kind of speaks volumes in a way that only Freemasons, as you and I or and other brothers kind of kind of say, right? That that's just basically comes back to the whole charlatan of this whole thing, right? So, yeah, you know, it's, I, think it's, he just used, I think he just used it as a creative way to just drum up more mystery to him. Yeah. Was he a member of the Golden Dawn? Yes, he's probably one of the most notorious members of, of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He wanted to be a magician. He literally as he's in this society and he's throwing himself. I mean, literally, you have all the money, quote unquote, in the world. Let's let's yeah. just play with that. Right. Yeah. 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 And you're around all these people who right off the bat saw you as a charlatan <laughs> faking who you were. Uh you, you already had a bad taste in everybody's mouth, uh, going to these events, but you threw yourself in here to say, I want to be a magician. Right. I want to be this guy that brings something great to this cause. So, do you think and, that that the reason? I mean, I mean, I mean, sorry to stop you, but like, no, you're fine. I mean, if is it because he had money? Because if the, if if, Go if I mean, for the, the the Golden Dawn, he shows up at the Golden Dawn and he's just bullshitting with this, uh, you know, fake accent and his and his fake mustache and this shit. And these guys are like, "This is bullshit." Why didn't they throw him out and tell him to get fucked? <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, it's I because he was probably, like, he's writing checks and going, "Hey guys, I want to, I want to be here. Uh, help me out." Like, I don't think it was that. I, don't, no? I think it was a little bit of that. Don't get me wrong. I think. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little bit about that for a second. So, I think he had a very great animal magnetism. Okay. Yeah. Very charismatic. He was hooking up with one of the, um, I believe Elaine Simpson was her name, and uh, who was a wife of one of the Golden Dawn members. He was hooking up with her. And he was able to just be interesting enough to keep around. Okay. He was throwing himself into this. He okay. wasn't a part of a religion at, quote, at that time, I would say, because right. he wasn't a part of the Pullman's Brethren. Right. He understood and felt that there were supernatural forces at work with himself, and he felt like, I'm here to do something truly special. So throwing himself into these rituals, we know that we know for a fact as he goes into these and elevates through the orders, he decides to buy a house in lock on Loch Ness called Bolmskin. I believe that's how you say it, Bolmskin. Yeah, Forskin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people are buying rocks right now. Yeah, I'm gonna pop, like, I'm gonna put up a picture of it right here. I mean, people are buying a rock from from the house that Crowley owned in Scotland with like a cert, a, a certificate. How ridiculous. I, I, you know, I, like literally, that's like about as a sham as the My Pet Rock uh, <laughs> event. You know, you're just literally throwing your money away. But hey, yeah. each their own. No. So he buys this estate because he wants to perform one of the most sacred rituals called Aber, the Abermelon. It's a 14th century ritual that deals with high level magic of calling upon your guardian angel. Right. And it's like a six month or a year endeavor to just get yourself prepared. You have to basically live off bread and water. You gotta, I believe it has to point east and it has to have a Terrence and he had to import sand in it. And I believe in the one book I read, Do It Thou What Thou Wilt by Lawrence Sultan, uh, he want, I believe the sand was there to see the footprints of the demons and angels that he would call on. That's the reason why. And um, three in the morning, your chance, you're doing invocation of getting yourself into this mode of this uh, level to talk to these things. Right. Now, one would argue, is it hallucinations? Is he wearing himself too thin and he's seeing what he, his imagination and his subconscious are doing? Did he really try to invoke something? What we do know during the six months as he's doing this, he's, uh, he's, he's very dedicated to it. And I think he's getting upset that nothing's really happening. Mm -hmm. 
There are claims that he said that while he was working in rooms, it was getting darker and darker. And even with a light, you could barely see again, is that psychological. Mm-hmm. Is it, you know, is it, is it this mind playing tricks on him because he's making himself so delirious right. to get himself into that altered state. Mm-hmm. But what we know is he doesn't complete the ritual. Right. Samuel Lindell, McGregor Mathers was having problems with, uh, with an issue going on in the golden dawn. And and Samuel and Delma Gregor Mathers calls upon Crowley to come back to France and deal with this stuff. And Alistair wanted to get into the inner order of the Golden Dawn. He kept getting denied by Yates and by all these aristocrats who are a part of this because they didn't trust him. Right. They didn't like him. Right. And moving Good reason. forward, he goes to France. He goes to France and wants to... And where he tells Samuel and Dell McGregor Mathers what he what he wants, and he makes him get it, and he brings the certificate to the London Lodge, quote unquote, mm-hmm. I guess you would say, for lack of a better, London Temple. Right. And they just they just scoff at him, like like we're not going to recognize you. We're not. Re- we've lost our faith in Samuel and Dell McGregor Mathers, and what you see is an infighting to the point where even remember Crowley was messing with Elaine Simpson. Right, and they sneak in and change the locks on the members and lock them out for several days. Wow. It wasn't until they got a constable in there, and then uh, Alistair Crowley was thrown out uh, <laughs> like the baby with the bathwater. Like he was just thrown back out on the streets, and he moves on. But what we also see with that ritual that he left open at Loch Ness is you're never supposed to leave a ritual undone because right. it might open a door to other entities. Right. Yeah. Right, but but uh, uh, an important point out of out of that story too is that while he was there in the Golden Dawn, while he changed the locks and while he did those things, he basically pirated all that, all of the teachings, all of the all of the written oh, material, all of the ritual, like all all of the all yep. of the things that he wanted. He basically went in there and stole them. Yep, he went in there and stole them, and I think that's what Yates and them were all worried about that he was just going to. Um, He's just going to bastardize it here and you know open it up. Because he said to him, he said, you know, um, in one video he goes, well, when I was out, when the when I was over with the Golden Dawn, so was the Golden Dawn. You know? Right. Because what he does to get back at them, he publishes all their stuff. <laughs> Which is like rule number one. Don't, <laughs> don't, yeah. don't do that, right? Don't do that. Mm-hmm. And then he has the balls to work with another gentleman and create the AA. Which is an which is another society that him and a gentleman create, and they create grades, they create an outer order and an inner order. So he basically right. just bootlegs the whole golden dawn. Bootlegs the whole golden dawn. Yeah. But we'll get to that and how that all happened. Right. He takes time after this because he felt like they're just playing with magic. They're not really living with magic. It's all mm. milk and honey. Mm. So when we keep watching, he travels all around the world because he has money. Yeah. And when he travels all around the world, he's getting to see all different religions and all different, these different organizations. He's taking up Buddhism. And I think he, uh, a rare thing that most of us don't really get to experience. He gets to experience so many religions and see so many of the restrictions and setbacks that are going on with these religions. Right. And and I want to point out too, at this point, this is a great point to put out is that he, in his upbringing, in his in his childhood, and you know, with his father and everything, he basically was uh, um, beholden to this uh, religion. Uh, you know, he he followed the the sect of the religion. I mean, there was there was um, there was ritual. There was all these protocols. There was these things you should and shouldn't do. There was everything. You know, not so much different than any other religion, but also not so much different than maybe a secret society or, or something else. Right. So it's like the brotherhood of the Plymouth, you know, whatever the Plymouth brotherhood or whatever they want to call it. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, in a way it, it it was familiar to him in a way because he had that um, growing up. He, he had that experience of, you know, this is, this is how this is. This is what I know. So he saw that in the golden dawn. He saw that in all these other, um, religions, and he saw it in all these other mystery schools. And I think for him, 
it was just what he knew. It's just like, well, this is how this works. This is, this is, I, this is what I know. I, I know that, um, you know, that there's a com, uh, a, a brotherhood uh, or whatever, right? This thing that, that this, whatever this is, this is, is yeah, like, unites this, them. yeah, it glues you together, right? In a way. Yep. And he sees that all over the world. And, and like you said, it's, it's, it's Buddhism, it's Jew, you know, Judaism, it's, uh, the know, ends. Yeah. It's everything, Hindu, right? Yeah. Hindu, it's, you know, yeah. It's yeah. All this, you so know? he's putting it all together. He's, he's, he's got, he's got mad money for 1800s. He's just going, fuck it. I'm going to go see what I'm going to, I'm going to see everything I want to see. I'm going to yep. do it. And he sees it all, right? Yeah. And he, what he, I think he sees, just like the secret societies, just like, just like religion, a control. A control over people yeah you know um to an extent late, and, and the people when, that and the people that are in power that have that, that exert that control right yeah i mean think about it i mean you have a small group of people saying in these secret societies that you can go forward only when we tell you to go forward right and i think he uses that to manipulate a lot of people totally. so as he's seeing a taste of all these organizations he meets up with a woman named rose kelly Mm-hmm. Who was a friend of his uh, sister's, or a friend's sister, mm-hmm. and she's supposed to be wedded to some guy, and they basically said he's like, "No, run away with me," and she doesn't. Again, it's that magnetism, it's that charisma, it's that eccentric life. Yeah, money. We're gonna get a boat. We're just gonna go. Yeah, I'm Alistair Crowley. You know, jump with me, and we're going to Egypt today. Yeah, and he did. He absolutely did. Mm-hmm. And he wanted, and during this time, I would say, in several different cited sources, I we saw that um, he was partaking in a little bit of drugs. I would say like marijuana at that time. And him and Rose were going to Egypt, mm-hmm. and they were visiting the pharaohs, and they were going to the chambers. And mm-hmm. he gets in there, and he wants to impress his wife, like any probably magician wants to do back in those days. And he starts performing a uh, a magic ritual inside like the, some people say it's a cave i heard i've seen in several uh, books that he was actually in the chamber of the kings on a night and he's he's re, he's talking about this ritual and he's performing this ritual in front of her to show her i am a great magician because this is we got to go remind everybody but this is a time when it was like 18 whatever you can just there wasn't any ropes and there wasn't anybody standing outside the the the, uh the pyramid you just roll up in there and if you want to camp in there for the night you can if you got a little money (laughs) the guards are going to look the other way yeah you You just give that guy you know whatever and he's going to go hang out so you can just live there for the day if you want and again and again we see this i need to change my identity when i'm with these people he starts wearing uh one of the sultan hats. He's basically a sociopath. I mean, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously. Yeah. 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 The sadist, totally. I would say too. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of names, but on. he's just going to, he's just going to make it happen where he's at. Yeah. I would say that absolutely. He's mm-hmm. wearing fine robes. He's mm-hmm. calling himself this, this leader. And, you know, he's, and this is queen, whatever her name right. is. Yeah. And he's had, he pays these peddlers to pull the carriage and sweep people out of the way. I mean, the guy's a white Englishman. Yeah, right. You know, he's, he's no Egyptian. He's no some Arab sultan. I mean, this is these people are as white as white can get. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, you know, but it's an allure. Yeah. He's throwing people out here. He was a showman. You know, he was a showman. Showman. You know? Yeah. We're here. Yeah, it, no pun intended. He's like the greatest showman, you know? <laughs> without the musical. Yeah, he did. And yeah, sex magic. Yeah, yeah, sex. Yeah, I mean, if you throw the sex magic in there, then he, he probably wins. But right. What's interesting about this, though, during this time in particular, hmm. he's trying to show in his diaries again. Let's think of creative writing when we when we talk about his. Well, right, because you're not going to talk shit about yourself. <laughs> no. But I think what's interesting in this, John is that you look and this is a moment where oh no the hero doesn't have this rel- this revelation of what of of his powers but what he does say in this journal is that during some drugs and during what kind of drugs are we taking here 
like I said, I think it was marijuana. I've really? I never seen a lot. They haven't really talked about all that, but I think it was marijuana when he talked to Iowa Watson. We're getting into that right now. I thought it'd be on way, uh, way something stronger than that, but it wasn't heroin. He wasn't into heroin and cocaine until it was later on when he was in the Abbey of Philema. So. I remember him taking peyote. I remember you know reading like you know all yeah. That I mean, stuff, he's but... probably on a slew of things because he's well, all around the world. He's probably well, yeah. on vision quest with shamans and all this stuff. I mean, yeah, you and know, it wasn't drugs back then. It was just like hey, it was just it was just prescription. Right. Yeah. Well, it was just like we're it's just this thing and we're gonna do it. It wasn't like Yeah, you know. The man yeah. wasn't coming yeah. down on you because you had a pound of, of hashish on you. They were just like yeah, Go ahead. hashish was a big thing he used. We right. could definitely say he's we could definitely say he did that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but, I just want to put it in context. So like he's in this he's in this pyramid and he's he's real he's real high <laughs> on weed yeah. and hash or yeah. whatever. He's, he real, really, he's not getting anything. It's just not happening. Not happening. Yeah. But this chick is just sitting there going, cool, you're doing, you're awesome. Well, what's interesting is Rose starts hearing voices okay. during these rituals. Because we're mm-hmm. doing rituals together. She devoted herself. To it. She wanted to do rituals. She wanted to. She was all in. She was like, this. I'm in. But I- she starts saying, like, over and over again, they're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. And mm-hmm. he's like, who's waiting for me? You know? Right. right. And he's like, I'm the magician. <clears throat> who, who are you talking about? Right. And she says, uh, she says, Horus. And to Crowley, from what he writes, is she wouldn't know anything about Horus. You know, like she was just an English girl. She doesn't know anything about these Egyptian gods. I've devoted myself to these go- to these studies and practices. Right. So he tests her with uh, several questions, and she starts striking them all off. Hmm. Again, we don't hear her side of the story. Right, of course. <laughs> and... Then he's like, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take her to this Egyptian. Mm-hmm. And in Cairo, right? Is in, this Cairo. in Cairo. And he right. wants, yeah. And he wants to point out, she wants her to point out who is Horus. Mm-hmm. So he drops her, he goes in with her, and they're going through this. And I, again, several other places I got my information of, they say she passed several pictures of Horus and he's laughing to himself. He's like, silly girl. Mm-hmm. She doesn't even know what she's talking about. She doesn't even know a horse is right in front of her. But she gets to this one certain thing and says, that's what, that's who it is. Mm-hmm. And the exhibit number is 666. Right. How, how, how shocking, you right. know? If I was a writer and I wanted to have a captivating audience, I'm definitely going to utilize the B666 mm-hmm. with what I'm doing. It just has that little shock value. Yeah. Was there you know, 666 exhibits in the Cairo Museum in 18. <laughs> yes, there was, you know. I mean, maybe, but no, I no, I totally get it. he's just, you know, he's definitely embellishing his own story. And, and exactly. um, you know, I really wish know, we, I really wish we'd find the, the, the hidden gospel of, of Bill, the guy that hung out with, uh, um, with Alistair and was like, this guy's just full of shit. <laughs> I, w- I, wish we could, I wish we could find that, like, you know, Victor Neudberg or, you yeah, know, I would love just to hear somebody WBH. be like, I am so tired of this bastard. Like, I would just, love yeah. to hear WBH, the time and troubles of Aleister Crowley <laughs> and the Golden Dawn. Mm-hmm. And he gets there and he says, oh my goodness, she is speaking to these things. Right. She is speaking to whoever. Somebody so right there is a, a blow to your monster ego. If you're exactly. probably, you just like got knocked out. For, for a guy who was, I want to see, he was, a, he was a homosexual, but he was also a man's man. You know, he was a dominance to, to him too. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it just there's so many enigmas. I mean, there's just so many. I think that you know, it's, the dude just he. Well, he was bisexual, if you really want to call it. Well, yeah, but he couldn't. I mean, he, he he's just look. I think he's just grasping at anything he can to find an identity or a home. You know. Yeah, and because he wanted to be prolific. I think he met with Yates and all that, and he wanted to be like Yates. He wanted to be a poet. But was Yates was Yates bi- was Yates big for the time? Was he like Yates yeah, the yeah, guy? Yeah. Like was Yates like the famous guy? You know, at the yeah, time, yeah, he was one of them. Yeah, he's okay. a well known. He's a well known. Uh, I mean, he is now, but I mean, then was he just like, oh shit, that's that's Yates? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he was hmm. thrown along the names right with Bram Stoker and all that at the time, right. and he was just a prolific guy. And, yeah, so he I wanted to be. Crowley he wanted to be wanted that. that. I think yeah. Crowley wanted to be somebody that could leave a legacy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he and he also so, came from the shadow of his his money that he didn't earn that he didn't that he didn't yeah. own and this family he never really worked never worked ever in his life. His his, yeah. his his daddy was a crazy preacher that dedicated his entire life to this 
really super religious sect that basically laughed at him and then he died yeah. and told basically told him too bad dude and and so i don't he, believe we yeah. i don't believe we talked about how we really got into rituals real quick so we have to jump back to the golden dawn right sure now. he went he met a guy by the name of alan bennett is that how we got? How did he get into the Golden Dawn? Let's. I'm sorry. Does, did we? He knew somebody from what I, I don't have the exact name. I, but he, like he knew somebody who knew somebody and he got somebody in there. Or other. Yeah. He knew somebody, and again, he was a part of that thing where he had a little yeah. bit of money, and they said, "Hey, you know, you want to get in? You want to go to a? Want to become a member of the Golden Dawn?" And right. It's not like the Moose else. Club. It's. Like, <laughs> it's yeah, the, but yeah. in there, he met a guy named Alan Bennett, and okay. even though everybody was kind of ostracizing him because of how he was conducting himself as like yeah. a fake Russian. Yeah. Alan Bennett was a member of this and he was devoted to yoga and whatnot. And Alistair's like, I really need to learn how to do this. And before he did the whole Abermelon ritual and everything, Alan Bennett was the gentleman who he basically, because you never, one of the big rules about learning math is you never get paid for it. Well, what Alan Bennett needed was a place to stay and food and all this other stuff. He was a little destitute. And Alistair, I think, sought the opportunity of having a magical mentor uh, and said, hey, you can live with me in my flat. Let's open up. Let's create two rooms, a white temple for white magic and a black temple for black magic and teach me how to do this. They even had an account where Alan Bennett was floating in the Again, Crowley, yeah, writing, of course. creative right. writing. Uh, Crowley's writing about how he was almost in disbelief about this magic until he saw Alan Bennett floating in the London flat. <laughs> you know, just in deep meditation, just six feet off the ground. Yeah, he walks in and Alan Bennett is floating off six feet off the, yeah, the and yoga mat. Said, I need to devote myself to this. Crowley never floated, from what we know. <sighs> So now, I mean, I, I hate to, I hate to jump. I mean, this is not part of the story, but I, I've, I've heard um, other sources say um, that there's some people that can get so deep into meditation. Monks, uh, Buddhist monks, I think, it was was one of the sources that they actually could levitate. Like they're levit uh, meditating, levitating monks. It was well, if thing. there is, I don't think we've seen a lot in society today with all of our camera and flip phones and stuff like that. No, you know? no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, t no, totally. But I'm just saying it's not like a, uh, it's not like I haven't heard that before or, right. or levitating objects like rocks and things like that. I think that, you know, some of the Tibetan, Tibetan monks, uh, I don't know the results. Yeah, these things. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not just saying that, that, I mean, that could have been, I think maybe Crowley like fell, I mean, worst case scenario, Crowley fell, fell on this dude who f had, figured some of this shit out <laughs> yeah i think that's what it was now getting back into where wrote where he getting back to the cairo museum and once he saw the exhibit 666 he immediately took it as a sign that she is telling truth. she did point out for us and this image that uh resonated with him and he starts listening to her and basically she says for three days, this entity is going to talk to you, and you must arrive one minute early into this makeshift temple, I think, that was going on wherever they were running. And you have a pad and pen, pen and this, somebody's going to speak with you. The goddess Horus is going to speak, or Thoft, or one of those guys. Right. And what we, what we see, is, or what we read, is that he, for three days, he went into these rooms. This fucking guy. Yeah, yeah, Iowas. And uh or lad or what it would lamb lamb yeah. lamb or and he said this person whispered in his ear. So he's in and, this cave or whatever the fuck. No, I think he was inside his flat, like or inside his like apartment mm. in, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And you know, for an hour a day he was spent in deep meditation a minute before noon mm -hmm. and he had a pad and pen. And he's right in front of this altar, and somebody would speak above over his shoulder, and it was that Iowas. Now, right. what is Iowa? Could it be a figment of his imagination? Could Crowley has could Crowley have thrown himself into something which would have been interdimensional? You know, one thing I, you know, could it be a god? Could it be all fake? Let's look at it from this thing. Let's let's look at the creature for let's look at the entity for a minute. If you look at it, it 
kind of resembles a gray. Yeah, like gray alien everybody's been seeing from since Whitley Strieber's book in the 80s, uh, you know, and everybody's reported for forever, you know. I mean, that, you know, to tie in ufology into this whole thing, you could arguably say that this may be the first rendition of a, of a gray alien, right? Correct that, me if I'm wrong. There wasn't no talks about grays in the late 1800s, correct? No, no, not that I'm aware of. I mean, there's cave paintings. There's different There's different other drawings of, you know, big-eyed, uh, big-headed beings and things like that. There was no... There was no, how about this? There's no collective um, uh, uh, um, per se. There was, there was no like, um, uh, you know, everybody kind of knows what a gray alien is now, right? There was no like, the, everybody looks at this as, oh, yeah, that's an alien. You know, like, you know, kind of whatever the mindset that we've had, you know, the, the uh, societal imprint that we have now as a, as an alien as a gray alien that didn't exist in 1800 nobody you know nobody knew what that was nobody even talked about it i mean even if they did there wasn't a there wasn't a normal alien stereotype or, or photo or or picture or everybody knew what an alien was this was and this wasn't an alien let's go back to that i mean to him this was a it, i don't even know i don't I, 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 well you could look at it as an interdimensional being you, i mean but, probably but looked was, at it more as a god so, so Crowley said that this God came to, that he yeah. thought Lamb, Ios, whatever was a God. To bring the new e eon of uh, this new age. The, yeah. And, so, and he, this was, the, this was the whatever that was going to help to tell Crowley to do this, to, to whatever he yeah. was to write down. This is, this is the, this is what we need to know. During the three days that he spent listening to this being talking this quote unquote let's put quotes on it divine mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. talking to him is the day when he wrote the uh the book of the law the book and of the law one of his like founding i guess for lack of a better word commandment was do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law and he says this entity spoke to him and this was the ground workings of his own religion the lima i think it's so interesting what you notice about and what you see is that for a man who despised religion and restriction, he also came to the same conclusion, I must create a religion that goes against the grain of all religions. Of all the... Uh, go against all of uh, restrictions and mm -hmm. just enjoy yourself and live your life and you know let your conscience and your destiny make define who you are by experiencing all this i think he used that from his travels around the world and all the other religions that he had witnessed and, and all the other religion restrictions and said man they got this going i like this religion a little maybe but they have this restriction this restriction you can't eat pork you can't do all that <laughs> blah, 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 blah. yeah and he wanted to create something where free range right and what's interesting do, do we know for a fact that he, if he wrote that if he created that entity or is that just a makeup of somebody else um i i am pretty sure i mean i, I have to do more research on it but i'm pretty sure that that's his uh, that's his actual drawing i'm pretty sure that that is the drawing that he created of lamb um during that time that this is the this is the being that spoke to him um okay. there's you know, there's obviously a bunch of different. Um, Is he wearing like a cape on there? It's like a, yeah, it's like a cloak or like a cape or or something like that. I mean, it's it's a. Uh, well, yeah. What I mean, do it doesn't look know, like he has no neck. We'll call him no yeah, neck. Yeah, it doesn't look like he has no neck. Doesn't look like he barely has a chin. And what yeah. are we what are we seeing right there? We're looking at an entity that has a big brain, wisdom, you know, and. Yeah. I don't know. It just looks as like you know. Is his create is his creativity getting the best of him? Is maybe he's having delusions and hallucinations uh, about these entities, you know? And he's just utilizing everything he's experienced to create the foundation and the framework for his for his future religion, Galima. Well, you know, so like going going to ufology a little bit because you know that's kind of that's you know my 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 bag a little bit um you know I, i've heard a lot of different um 
So, you know, Tom DeLong has stated before that um, it seems that humanity seems to center themselves or align themselves or or, or follow uh, man. Mankind dis, uh, has a, a ability to um, organize itself behind a priestly class. And that's I think that's a quote. Um, uh, organize itself behind a priestly class. So, when you think about it, um, Crowley in all of his travels and all of the things, he sees all these religions, he sees all the good, he sees all the bad, he sees all the, you know, maybe we shouldn't do any of this shit, but then all of a sudden he's like, well, maybe we should have, our own, I should have my own religion. But, but, um, so then therein lies the organization behind a priestly class again. It's like, you, you know, does this guy, does this thing show up and say, oh, I got all the answers for you. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you this shit. And, you just need to get people behind you because more of you will, the numbers of you will do, you know, I, you know, I'm just paraphrasing, you know, I'm just making things up as I'm talking here, but you know, basically it's like, was it something that this thing, this entity, if this was an entity or a being or an interdimensional or, or an alien or whatever the hell you want to call it, an other, did it instruct him to create this religion because of that's their MO? What if, what if this thing showed up to um, the Gnostics or what if this thing showed up to the Buddhists? What if this thing showed up to the Christians or whatever This uh, in, in, a, in another form and say, hey, this is the light. This is the way. Uh, organize your people under me and, and I'll show you the way. Well, here's an interesting thing. And in stuff like the Theosophy Society mm -hmm. and our Theosophy and other uh Eastern uh, esoteric, for like you know, for for that. Yeah. Uh, we hear this thing called the secret chiefs, and Plavat, Madame Blavatsky talked about them. Mm -hmm. uh, Max Heindel talked about them in his Rosicrucian Christian lecture. Or yeah. In, yeah, the Rosicrucian Christian lectures. And what we're what we see is. And even Crowley talked about the secret chiefs. And the secret chiefs were these other plane entities that were a higher plane that gave divine messages to people. So could we see that this could be his interpretation of what the secret chiefs were speaking to him? Could be. You know, we know one thing. He was solely into demonology, mm -hmm. summoning demons. Mm -hmm. We also see that he was very much into uh, Egyptian mythology mm -hmm. with Horus and Thoth. Hell, he created his own tarot deck to Thoth. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that was his interpretation of what he perceived as the secret chief giving him a divine message during these, you know, um, drug escapades and met deep meditation. You know, the mind works. The mind works so interestingly. You know, I mean. Hell, our dreams. Sorry about that. No, our so, dreams. Our dreams interpret and create different entities too. You know. Yeah, and and like you said early on in our talk, I mean, who, who's to say he didn't stumble on something? Like, yeah, who, who's, who's to say that? who's to say that he didn't get way hashed out or way? You know, he had fifteen peyote caps, and he entered that plane. You know, fully intent on finding something. Yeah, and, and finding yeah. it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And finding yeah. it in a way that he was just like... Yeah. I'm looking at it as debunking you know, all of this stuff because he has these trails of destroying people's lives mm -hmm. throughout and lying and deceiving and portraying himself as these people when really he was a charlatan. But who's to say he didn't, with his tolerance and stuff, he didn't get into a next wave of consciousness with an entity on an astral plane. Right. And, and uh, who's to say that, that whatever that entity was, wasn't just fucking with him. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he opened the door. <laughs> it was just like, Hey, this asshole opened the door and we're going to kick it in. Yep. I would, uh, I would definitely say, and maybe, and you could also say when he was doing the Abermelon ritual in Scotland, maybe right. he opened the door and maybe he was possessed. Maybe he was had, being terrorized in his mind with these entities or as he was getting into more magic and all this other. Magic. 
Yeah. So we yeah. both. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. It's. I mean, we. I just keep. I just keep wanting to come back to the theme that all of this, all of the historical documentation, the shit that we know, is written by Crowley, or Crowley, exactly. whatever. Crowley, 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 Crowley. And you're absolutely right. And if I was writing a story, I'm definitely not going to make it a boring story. No, because in 1995, it was a great year for me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You know what I mean? I did a lot of cool things. I did a lot. I did a lot of great things in '95. We, all, I think, we'll all agree that 2020. There was a few. There's a few bright spots. I can't <laughs> lie in my personal life, but other than that, it's been a very rough year for all of us. Well, yeah, but I mean, the, you, we, we both shined. We had a lot of good. We had a good moments. Yeah, we had a lot of good. Moments. Yeah, but still, no. I mean, honestly, I mean, you can say whatever the hell you want. I mean, people read about it a hundred years from now. They're like, oh, Crowley opened a gate to to hell. Right, and the demons like came out. Google. It's not like somebody would Google and be like, you're full of shit, Alistair. No, you know what I mean? No, everybody's going to just believe Alistair Crowley because, you know, he had the money to print his own shit. That's the other thing that we forget about. Like, everybody's just going to write a bunch of scrap people and people are going to burn it because they need fuel for fire. But uh, Crowley had enough money from the the brewery to print his own shit. Absolutely. He had enough money to print his own shit. And yeah. also the tabloids of the media ate it up. Because what else are they going to do? What else, what else? Yeah, I mean, you're upper class about, Englishman yeah. who is traveling all around the world and calling himself a black magician, taking saying, taking crazy pictures of himself with yeah, you know, and like having yeah. sex with men and women, right? And performing these sadistic rituals on people. I mean, and animals. Don't forget. And animals, and yeah, he and I think one thing he did, and I really want to get into this about yeah. Crowley, is he leaves Cairo, he establishes, and we're going to fast forward just a little bit, but yeah. he establishes the AA, which is like I said, the um, the it's not Alcoholics Anonymous. It, <laughs> yeah, it's not Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> it's the it's basically like an it's a it's his own interpretation of the Rosa of the uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Right. And with that, with the stolen shit that he actually came with the stolen shit and yeah. incorporating his own sex rituals, because what he what he realized in this was dominance and with the orgasmic experience, he perceived that in the height of having an orgasm, your consciousness. And your will could make things happen, you know, ritual in, in a ritualistic. So if you were doing something to like this God or something that if at that height of an orgasm, you could send it and make it happen. Yeah. There is no evidence that it happened. No. And what I think he did was he created a lot of followers. His money was running low and he was able, like with Victor Neuberg, abuse these people to live his life to still live his life and slow down the burning of all of the money that he was spending he was buying places he was wearing authentic robes he was eating he was traveling around the world that costs money the fortune doesn't last forever so now i need to figure out how am i going to make money which he did with the golden dawn rituals by after he published them he I think he rented out a, a, a theater and started portraying these in front of crowds. Wow. Charging admission to, to charging admission yep. and doing Victor, it. Yep. Victor Neuberg. Uh, yeah. Victor Neuberg. And then he meets up, he becomes a devout Crowley follower. And, and he's selling, he's, he's published these, he's published these books and he's selling them. And he's making some money on that. Right. So he's doing that and yeah. he's selling tickets and he's having a play basically. He's having a play. play and people are coming in and they're going, Oh wow. Gosh, this is, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he's doing it all up, and there's smoke and fire and whatever. Yep, and he starts meeting all these people and with his with the AA, and he starts building these cult followings. And, and then there's other people like him that show up that have money that are stupid and yeah. want to be, and they're they're just be like, part of it. They look at him as like the next coming, you know? And they're like just throwing money at him. Yep, and it's all great until the money starts wearing out. Yeah. And what we also see is he takes advantage of this Noidberg. Yeah, you know, in a lot, in more, in more he's ways. He's neglecting than, his wife. He's neglecting his wife. He's yeah. cheating on her. Uh, they had a child. The child died, and she becomes pregnant again. And she's just mentally exhausted from all this. Between that and alcohol and the drugs, she is yeah. so mentally exhausted. So 
He's bur- he's going through his first wife. He's got this cult following who's going to do anything. And he even goes out and performs this ritual uh, out in the desert with Noidberg, where he puts Noidberg, after days of walking in the desert, he puts Noidberg in a salted circle. Yeah, so th- this is them two in a... Then th- of course, we, I have to preface this again. This is Crowley's writing, right? Because did, right. did Noidberg ever... Uh, not from my knowledge, no. But why but would you? I, right. Well, I heard he was mentally broken after it was all over. I mean, can I, you imagine? Can imagine. Probably, he used them up and spit them right back out. He's, yeah. Well, for people that don't that don't know what we're talking about, this is terrible, and I'll let you explain it because I can't even stomach it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he gets this follower and through AA called Victor Neuberg, and this guy becomes a devout Crowley guy. He thinks he is the next. Real. He, he drank. He drank the juice, right? Yeah, he's he a, was drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah. And he basically, when Crowley said, I needed money, he was writing the checks for whatever he uh-huh. needed. You right. know? And this guy author. wasn't dumb. He was an author, I think, right? Or he was a... Uh, I'm um, not quite sure what he was. He was doing... I can't think of it right now. He had, enough, he had enough money. He was smart. He, he, he yeah, wasn't just yeah, some yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah, right. He <laughs> he had he had definitely money to facilitate, help Crowley facilitate his lifestyle. Right. But he was also a homosexual who also was... Who was uh, Crowley figured that out and took advantage of him and basically mm-hmm. was having sex magic mm-hmm. to get to him, and which made him even more of a devote follower because Crowley was this dominating sadist kind of guy. Right. And back and, then, I mean, you got to remember too that like this was like if people found out you were gay, it was like you get locked yeah, up, was, you went to prison kind of thing, right? Like you were going absolutely. to jail. You you couldn't just bang dudes, right? I mean, this nope. wasn't happening. I mean, you were you were going to jail. They like, nope. ostracized the, you. The, the 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 local officials were watching him back when he was with Alan Bennett, who was just living with him. Right. You know, Think, thinking that he was gay and that they were going to break him up. Yeah. And they were watching him. Right. But Crowley also had this shock value of, hey, I'm out. This is who I am. Mm-hmm. I love this. I have sex with him. I have sex with her. I'll have sex with both of them. Right. And what we so he, we took we took Norberg out into the desert for he days, hiked to hike for, de- the de- for days. Algeria? I want to say it was Algeria, and with like the, hiked for days in the middle of hiked for days. They're all disoriented and everything. Like, and the next like there's no out, water. They're, like they're just basically right. dying in the desert. Yep, and they do this thing, and it's e. Uh, how do you say it? It's uh, angel magic. It's called a. Mm. Uh, uh, not Enochian. It's, oh, um, it's Enochian. Enochian. Enochian yeah. magic, yeah. Enochian magic. Mm-hmm. And he says, I'm going to experience this. And he says, to protect you, Noidberg, I'm putting the salt, because salt represents a purity, mm-hmm. purifying circle. And he puts them in there. And he says, you stay in there as I conjure these demons. And out in there, they're chanting and they're throwing fire and they're doing all this stuff. And, and just the, the people have no idea what the fuck we're talking about. But, but if you do, if, if you're doing magic, you put yourself in the circle and you protect yourself from the shit yeah, that's going on out there. Right. So you're, you have, you make your own circle and you're in the circle and uh, supposedly and shit outside of the circle can't come in. Right. So he decides to just put this guy in the circle and he's, he's on the outside of the circle going, Alistair Crowley is just yeah, like, Alistair Crowley's hey, going, come, hey, come and fuck with me. Yeah, bring it on. You know, hey, ghost, it's your boy. You know? Or, right? hey, yeah, it's yeah. Your boy. yeah. And what we, what we see and what we, what, what's, well, what we don't see, but what's written is that they had these crazy hallucinogenic experiences where things are happening, you're seeing things, everything, and then it ends up where Basically, you know, Alistair Crowley at fucks Neuberg out of the desert and comes right as he's coming. He, at that point of orgasm, he gets this, I must create this religion. Right. And he had his first follower who was Neuberg. Right. When they're ble- bleeding, uh, butthole bleeding in the middle of the desert. Yes, definitely. You know, and there was even a, there was, it's so funny. It's so funny. It's about funny, but it's terrible for the guy, but well, it's just, it's just terrible for the whole thing. It's terrible for the victim, right? Yeah, you know? no, it, the whole, the but whole you thing. But you open yourself up to have this guy 
taking advantage of you. Yeah. And what also you notice is, uh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> you had the vision of Neuberg in the desert. No, I, I'm just like you know, it's know. just getting up. You can't, you can't, you can't not see that. <laughs> yeah, but what you see is is that he says, "I need to create this and start to under start creating this religion." <laughs> Sorry, I'm just all messed no, up. No, no, no. Right at because yeah. So it's just a crazy time. No, know so I mean? so then he's like, I'm gonna do the Thelema thing. But you know, I going back to it, did did this guy did this thing? Was it th was it this thing? I mean, I don't know. I mean uh, uh you know, when you when you open yourself up or when you meditate or when you experience, uh, you know, if you take hallucinogenic drugs or, you know, whatever you get, you elevate yourself to a, an elevated state of consciousness, do you automatically turn a beacon on to whatever it is? It, it, is it, is it, does it, do you all automatically turn yourself into a bug light, a bug zapper? Maybe, maybe. You know, where are these maybe, other, where these, maybe these, these other things entities are, are coming right to you. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, Maybe that's a bad thing. Like, you're like, oh shit, yeah. they, they, they see you, and then you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, they just come to you, and then this happens. You know, if th this is one thing that was definitely said in one of the documentaries I watched about Aleister Crowley. This is what I wanted to say. Hmm. After after a time where Neuberg is getting sick and tired of him, I believe his mother says that Aleister Crowley contacted him contacted her, contacted mm -hmm. Neuberg's mom, and says, if you ever want to see your son again, you will give me 500 pounds. <laughs> like, he ransomed, he ransomed him. He himself. ransomed the guy that he's been stupid. You know, he must have been a hell of a power bottom. In, wow. In, in gay terminology. He must have been, uh, he was changing people all, you know, he was spinning them around and changing their way of lifestyle, but it just shows you who Aleister Crowley was. Like, literally, he was taking advantage of people and, you know, using them for his own pleasure, where Neuberg eventually got sick of them and got rid of them as well. Mm -hmm. But with this, he meets a man named Theodore Ruse, and Theodore Ruse was a German who created the OTO. Mm. He was one of the founders of the OTO. The OTO. Yeah, Ordo Temple Ordus. And... They're still around. They're still around, and you know they're just a bunch of hipsters, you know, <laughs> thinking that they're cool, a bunch of hippies, you know, thinking that they're playing with magic. And what's interesting about this is this guy gets to know Crowley. Mm -hmm. and Crowley takes this religion that he's founding called Thelema mm -hmm. and gets involved in the OTO, and. He basically he does the same shit he infiltrates the oto like he did the golden dawn like he right. did the uh everything else that he ever got to in his life yes and what he does is he creates these other grades or practices of whatever just, yeah whatever. just makes and makes another shit up and he follows this is the, where yeah. he incorporates his insect magic right and he's selling out these brochures and in the meantime he's writing for a thing called the equinox and He's basically getting this out there and he's building his following that this is what we must do. So this is like 19... Something. Or something, other. right, right. So early yeah. 1900s, right? We're talking... Yeah, this is like yeah. probably 30-something at this time or something like that. Yeah, so like, you know, society's changed a lot from the time he started dicking around and, and, and taking boats across the, you know, oceans. You know, there's planes, there's there's uh, newspapers, there's written type, there's, there's, you know, the beginnings of radio, you know, things like that, telegraph. So world word is traveling faster. There's more of a um, society is becoming um, more connected, more you know closer to what we understand as society. But you know, hundred years, hundred hundred fifty years ago, whatever it is now, right? So it, it's not that it, it, it's not so much just ramblings of a dude. There's press. Yeah, absolutely, and. He now has a base to be able to spread his message of the book of the law. Sorry, that's my cat. No, bring it. Is it a boy or a girl? Who's that? The boy, Hades. Hades. I can't see his eyes. Yeah. And he's part, he's, you know, they're always half in and half out. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and what's just so interesting with it, John, is you just start seeing this massive following for Thelema go. 
to beginning to grow. Well, but like you were, like we were saying early on in this talk is like, but that's the time of the uh, the new age enlightenment where people had money yeah. and they wanted to see things that were not spiritual. Yeah, the spiritual, spiritual, age, the spiritual spirit, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted to like do seances and tarot was a huge thing and all these other things were just anything that was um, esoteric or avant garde. It was like everybody thought that was cool. Yeah. What was interesting about this religion and Kenneth Anger, who I don't agree with on probably one bit, well, I can't say that. I, 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 he made an interesting point that the the Thelema, this religion that he started, was was a solar religion. I mean, it was a masculine religion. Okay. It was a it was a religion where man ruled and women were a part, but they had more of a lunar energy to mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. They had more of a you know a submittedness to who he was, which is what he loved, because he loved power. He loved control over, over them. And I think that's an interesting to point out because one thing you notice with his followers, he was made. He was with Neuberg. He locked him up and basically had him in the shed, or wow. like a little a little room where he lived. And, and put he puts a lotion on, like a cot, you know. And yeah. He, you see that in cult leaders all the time, the brainwashing and, you yeah. know, and this is what we're going to do. And this is a sort of ritual where when you get people and you're controlling their food and you're controlling while they're sleeping and you're controlling, you know, how they do things, they become submissive and they become that uh, a cult. You know, they, fo- they follow they follow under that cult like structure. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he was trying to do. Other right. than that, I think he was keep trying to elevate this his enigma, his mystery of who he was as a person, because now you got to follow him. I mean, mm-hmm. literally, his wife. Now, now, now you have a stage. Now you now you have yeah. some people to perform in front yep. of. Him, right? And he was basically in. I think they. So, his wife Rose becomes a drunkard and it messes up her mind. And I think the drugs were also having a heavily effect. Well, I mean, they lost their, their daughter was like three and she died. They lost their daughter. To or something. Yeah. I mean, like how, I mean, being a dad, I mean, how would you, how would that just not ruin your entire life? Well, what he did was, and we're going, forgive us who's listening. Yeah. We went, all the way to where now he started the Lima and he has the following. Now we're going back. To back. Outside. But I'm just, I just wanted to make it a point. Like I, yeah. Well, he blamed Rose. He said it oh. was you. As I'm doing all this, you were the fault for yeah. our child. Dying. In the end, I don't really think he was the dad of the year. <laughs> That's you know? saying it, right? He was messing around with other women. He got back with that Elaine Simpson from mm-hmm. from the Golden Dawn and had an affair with her while he was in China. Mm. Uh, they lost their daughter. She get, They have another daughter. He's bringing whores back to Loch Ness when he goes there with her, and he's fucking these prostitutes in front of her as he locked in, in one documentary. He says that as she was hung upside down in the closet, he's you know going after you know he's plowing these people in their bed, whatever, and uh, it messes up her psyche so much that she has a mental breakdown. Well, why wouldn't you? Insta- yeah, he has to institutionalize her. <laughs> I think he started seeing from what Rose was and what Neuberg was going for because Neuberg was. We just that, figured out how to snap people. Yeah, break people out. That's yeah. that cult man tell you. Mm-hmm. L. Ron Hubbard did it. You know, Jim Jones did it. All these big cult leaders did this stuff. What was the people that uh, killed themselves with uh, when the comet came? <laughs> oh, Haley. Um, uh, 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 Hale Bop. Uh, um, Hill Bob, yeah, I know yeah. you talking about. Yeah, Bo and Peep, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. They, yeah, they're fucking yeah. the people take, you know, yeah, drink the Kool Aid and the shit's coming will, back. They're like, yeah. It will definitely come to me. Yeah, nah, we'll figure it out. But yeah, I mean, I just, I, I don't know. So like, what type, like, what type of person? I mean, I don't know. That's a whole different. We can have a whole talk about what type of person falls into that. But we're kind of getting to the point of it. Like these people are are coming from the same place that Crowley's coming from, or mm-hmm. it has came from. It's it's just that whatever your whatever your base belief in reality is has been shattered and you're looking for something else yeah and, and you're drawing followers to you you're not drawing right. leaders to no. you you're drawing people who want to be dominated right right and that you feeds know? your that feeds you and and your in your ego and you know and you just keep doing it and you just keep doing it and you just just it's just self-perpetuating and all that right until it finally yeah. 
blows Absolutely. up. Absolutely. You know, and when you're breaking people down, that's that power. That's there is a power to that. You know, and I hate to say this, and I hate to go this way because it's true, (laughs) but if you look at every religion or any type of priestly class or any type of power structure that exists on the planet, that exists. You definitely have tears in religion. You definitely have tears in society, in these societies or these these secret societies and organizations that have a the people the leaders the gods right you know what I mean? it's like a right. three tier it's like a three tiered system yeah I, and I, no no totally I, but i think like catholic church catholic church totally. like you know and i'm a catholic but i was I, I thought i was too i thought they threw us out there's something appealing to the catholic church when you're a young man and you're seeing the guy in the robes and they're doing all this stuff and you're you know, you're doing the transmutation of the bread and the wine and all that stuff. But what well, let's you... talk about this for a second. I want to talk about this. So I was I was raised Catholic. You were raised Catholic. Well, I didn't have a fucking choice. I didn't have a choice. I had six <laughs> priests. I had, a, I had six nuns and the former bishop of Toledo was in my family. You know, like, you're pretty Catholic. You, you didn't know? have a fucking choice. But as yeah. I'm saying is like, okay, you don't have a choice. So um, growing up, a uh, uh, a woman who was a follower of Crowley as a kid and she's growing up in Crowley's um, bullshit house in Scotland or whatever. Like they, that kid didn't have a choice either. That kid didn't have a choice. The uh, Let's go into that. Let's go further. Right. So Thelema, uh, he's getting this following. He's getting a couple concubines. He has a couple of them pregnant. Guess what? The kids, some of the, most of the kids don't live throughout that. He goes to Italy to create this chateau or this abbey of Thelema where he's going to do his church, where he's going to build his church. On these grounds, I shall build my church. Right. And uh, he devotes this chateau, which is still around today, mm-hmm. which still has his art. Yeah. And they're doing drugs. This is where he's getting into cocaine and heroin. and It's bestiality. This is where it's getting real. Bestiality. And children are running around naked and they even encourage the kids to watch adults have sex and he hits a follower i want to say her name is leah and during a black mass they bring a goat in Mm. and as they get the goat aroused right you know they and she did she was one thing you notice with occultists, like you got these girls who want to, oh my God, like I'll do anything for you, mm-hmm. Alistair. And these groupies. Yeah. And she allows this, uh, she allows this goat to inseminate her. Right. And to, you know, come inside. And when that happens, as a point of climax, Crowley slits the throat of the goat. Of the goat. Right. You know. What what happened? Is mm. there any magic that, that happened? I don't think anything happened. I think it was I don't think it was there. You know, I think he was trying to elevate it. I think he knew he couldn't get away with doing virgin sacrifices, even though he talked about it and the media wrote like he was a man that was eating flesh and you know doing all these debauchery things. I uh, I don't think he had the stones to try to do that and, you know, um, cut people open and. and well, I mean, it would put him in prison. Kind of I mean, even at that time, it was the 30s or whatever it was, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it would have put him in Just prison. Just a goat alone was more than enough. Though. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, I, and I think that, that that kind of, you know, at that point, it was just. The shock value, you know, I was like, what can, what can I do to keep myself relevant at this point? You know what I mean? Right. Because I mean, I mean, obviously there wasn't angels coming down from above, and there there wasn't demons running amok in this town in in Italy. I mean, there was just a bunch of fucking weirdos. I mean, you yeah, you can't tell me if Crowley did it. Why hasn't others done it? No, I mean, I'm sure there has been. I mean, we've seen that before in the press and, and news and things where people have like right. But do we see the effects of magical rituals? That's what I'm trying to say. You mean in society? Yeah, have we seen the effects of of uh, the spell working or this incantation working to whatever they're trying to bring up? How and invo- you know, and invocate. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, 
because it, it poses a, a really uh, brazen question to society. It's either this is bullshit or this is real. Right. And nobody can deal with the There's real There's no part evidence of it. that magic w- is real. Well, at least in the way of Crowley's. Well, yeah. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree that. But then on the other aspect of it, like, how do you, how do you say that prayer isn't real? Right. How do you say that if, you know, you get 400 people together in a room and you pray for somebody that, right. Um, well, that, know, that person Chris doesn't Vaughn spontaneously, here, you know, yeah. whatever. Right. Here's I mean, Vaughn writes that in Renaissance of Man and Mason, you know, and he talks about a child that was hurt and they did a, they did a circle of prayer and from his standards that, you know, the, the child was healed the next day. I agree. I agree uh, to that extent, but with it, when it comes to Crowley, yeah, he was just keeps doing more and more stuff to just accentuate who the Crowley mythos was. Right. He's he's building his building his legacy in his in the way he wants to present it to the world. Yeah. Exactly, and that's what. So I he's think. stealing shit from uh, um, true. And I'm gonna say I'm gonna go back and say that he he started at a source, uh, the Bible and whatever wh- whatever the Plymouth um, Brotherhood is was it the Bl- Brotherhood I'm I, I don't even Plymouth know. Brethren Brethren he took the the Plymouth Brethren's ethos the the meaning of that the Brotherhood the everything that he had with that and he incorporated that in his lifelong search to find that and everything else and when he found it or he didn't find it he added it to his own mythos to a point where he was uh he wanted to make himself this god or this higher being than what he was in so much as that he wanted to be relevant and he wanted to be relevant in a way that no matter what happened he was uh, an impact on uh, um, mankind. And it, it, maybe there were some hitchhikers along the way. Maybe yeah. there were some entities that, that um, or whatever you want to call them, right? Um, extraterrestrials, ultra-terrestrials, interdimensionals, whatever the hell you want to call them. Maybe there were some of those things that said, hey, this guy's playing with fire. Let's jump on top because it's our in right so so maybe that um and maybe he maybe well, he inadvertently stumbled upon some shit that um that he didn't even was uh, privy to so what i think crowley does and even when you see at the end of his life is crowley is doing all this debauchery kind of activities mm-hmm. and he's trying to elevate and he has these followers which are cutting themselves if they say the word i and you know f- you know locking them up and making them do all these cr- you know crazy rituals that's going to stretch their psyche what i think you see with that is it all comes crashing down once one of the members die and one of the girls leave his compound and starts uh going to england and talking to the to the newspapers that somebody died because they drank cat's blood. Yeah. Somebody died because they drank water. Excuse me. No, no, that's cat. She came up at the perfect time. I know. I just don't want him to knock down my, uh, no, it's good. Will knock down my thinker. Yeah. <laughs> and perfect timing. Cat's blood. The cat jumps up. Right. And, uh, where was I going? With no, that? no, no. It's like, it's like he, he finally got outed. He got outed. And it just ruined his pl- it ruined his base and platform. Yeah, and the drugs were wearing on him. Well, I mean, you can only take psychedelics for uh, Psychedel- thirty well, he's years. He's not heroin and cocaine at this point. Oh, okay. So he he just went full Gonzo and just decided to just say, oh yeah, and he needs to get his fix. And right. money was running dry on the people, and by that time, the money was really out on his on his fortune on his fortune inheritance he was had. gone. He yeah, squandered it all away. Yeah, it's all gone. Right. What I think Crowley does and between the end of his life and everything is he's showing this he's showing this freedom that this is what you can do without repercussions. Do exactly what you want. Do what that will. Right. And that entices maybe not the generation, maybe not his generation, but the younger people. 
Mm-hmm. You're seeing, you see that in the flower power movement right. and, you know, the Led Zeppelin's in the sixties and, you know, all these people, he, he showed this free will. And during the rock star rock and roll mentality, like that's what that was based off of. Yeah. I mean like black Sabbath made the, you know, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Led Zeppelin Jimmy Page was a devout follower, bought his, uh, bought his Scott is a uh, lot Ness property. Yeah. You know, David Bowie was a big follower of him. Right. And what you also notice is other people were followers of Crowley. L. Ron but, Hubbard was a follower of Crowley. Jack Parsons, you know, the rock, the original Rocket Man was devout to Crowley. He, matter of fact, uh, Jack Parsons was the head of the OTO in California. Right, Jack Parsons, JPL Laboratory. I mean, JPL. I mean, that's uh, you know anybody's into. Um, you know, space, rocketry, UFO, ufology, any of that stuff. J, you know, JPL is Jack Parsons laboratory, you know, Jack Parsons had some of the most, um, innovative, um, ahead of the, his times, uh, science, um, you know, propulsion. And he was doing a lot of these rituals and shit, like uh, Crowley's rituals. He was doing a lot of sex magic and, and black yeah. magic and, and with with yeah with with um I think with L. Ron Hubbard at the time and maybe some other I don't know if L. Ron Hubbard was with him or not. Yeah, he was. He was yeah. Absolutely. There's a interesting part where him and Jack Parsons were trying to do a uh, uh, the moon child ritual where the try to try to bring about this this thing called the Scarlet Woman. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Crowley was very big into the Scarlet Woman, and he called a lot of the women that he was with this, his his Scarlet Woman. Mm -hmm. It's like a feminine lunar power, right? To it, and uh, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard, and we already know what L. Ron Hubbard started the Church of Scientology, right? And that's going to be an interesting talk down someday. <laughs> but uh, he if, was if, into he was into rituals. He was into magic. You yeah, know? and they wouldn't they wouldn't launch it unless it was a certain day, a certain time, certain moon, like yeah, you know, all these things. It was astrology, yep. astronomy, it was numerology, all that stuff. And and he, you know, he really got into it. And um, you know, the, it, if you, you could look back now, and there was a lot of FBI files and and a lot of uh, Freedom of Information Act reports that uh, on um, Jack Parsons, where they were like basically just watching him and making sure that he wasn't being infiltrated by um, other governments, the Russians or you know anybody else. Yeah. They were trying to um, maybe um, use the, his interest in esoterica to divulge secrets to other uh, countries or entities that, you know, maybe have influence. And he was doing some weird shit, but he was making, he was, he was providing results. He was into some weird shit, but he was launching rockets and, and, and doing things that nobody else had done. So they kind of kept him on a, a on a surveillance, but they just kind of let him do what he was doing. And honestly, my personal opinion is that he got, he probably got into some weird shit, and he got into the point where he was a little more of a liability than an asset for some people, and he uh, had a rocket explosion in his garage. <laughs> yeah. I totally, uh, I totally agree with that. What's so interesting is the spiritual movement, like, really went around the whole world, the Russian Orthodox, and mm -hmm. to, you know, with the Blavatsky and the Germans and the Nazi and the Nazi occult, which you know is a whole other story for mm -hmm. you at another time. That's a whole, yeah. You know, and <laughs> but I think it was. Um, I, I I don't think that was. A coincidence. I think that was a um, that was going to happen. I think that that was a that was an inevitable conclusion to way the way that a society has been. We've evolved over the time, and I think more than definitely a consciousness. Yeah, the, and that's where I was going with it. More consciousness, like the collective conscious consciousness of the planet elevated itself to a position that was completely more aware of the non-dogmatic portion of reality where we have these things that, you know, we have these things we have, yeah. we have, um, you know, um, 
we don't have to believe everything that we hear in, in scripture. We don't have to believe everything that our elected officials or our church officials or or whoever we placed in power or wherever we we put our power. We don't have to put all of our beliefs and all of our 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 um our will into these people. And I think that was a a time where all of that was evolving and changing daily and it was collective it was a collective movement consciousness where we were you know the vibration of the planet or our consciousness was uh, evolving to a level where uh, honestly i'd like to say that we haven't until this time until recently i think until recently until until this pandemic until we've all had a chance to stop the wheel and look in inwards um, in, 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 and see who we really are as a, as a human, as a, as a person on the planet that, that, that really hasn't happened before, you know, um, until the sixties. I think that we, we as a society or, I mean, think about it, think about it in the last 10 years. I mean, in the last 20 years, I mean, we, we've gone from, you know, um, you couldn't have gay people on TV. You couldn't have, you know, um, just anything like that, you know, I, I, I'm really paraphrasing just grasping for straws here, but basically what I'm saying is like societal norms have been breaking down more rapidly than they ever have. in in, in my lifetime, you know, and I'm only 40. So, you know, I, I've seen the fall of these things that were just, you don't talk about that on TV. You don't do that in real life. And now you don't talk out against, you don't talk out against, I mean, you yeah. don't talk about against the church. You don't talk about yeah. against you know you know these I mean, things. You just don't do. But now it's like yeah okay that guy's gay. I don't care that chick's gay. I don't care. Yeah you want to do something else that's not part of the societal norm. Cool, do whatever you want as long as you're not screwing with anybody else. I don't know. I think that's kind of like a cyclical thing. But I also think it's part of a progression as a species that we're getting to. I don't know if this thing has anything to do with it. I don't know if Crowley has anything to do with it. I think that maybe Crowley stumbled upon some shit. Um, accidentally and uh, other people that were in a position of power or fame bound it and perpetuated his bullshit for as long as he has but maybe it fits what what where his effect you know because you know he basically by the time the end of his life is he's a used up heroin addict living in a boarding house and one of his devote followers wanted to have his child and he gets him weaned off the drugs and right. they have a child and right he, it's a boy and it's a boy alistair or something crowley mm-hmm. yeah it's a different uh, middle name and what we notice is that you know he and some sources that we see that he appreciated family at the end of his life and he dies and the way they die they say oh a thunder storm happened and it was a giant bang and it was the gods taking his soul back away when really he died of bronchitis but what we see as his effect of it's the generational split we've seen it in masonry mm-hmm. and we've seen it in society where one generation holds these values and the sons and daughters don't conform we saw that with the flower movement, flower mm-hmm. power movement in masonry, where our grandfathers were into the fraternity, the World War II generation. Everybody's into the fraternity, and they need a place to go and talk about their experience, and they need that brotherhood. They need all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And the more spoiled flower power movement that didn't go to war. And, you know, can't we just talk it out, man? And mm-hmm. It's all about love. And, you know, everything's cool. They're like, Dad, I'm not like you. Mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to be who I am, you know, and I'm not going to, I'm going to do everything completely opposite of what you do. Right. And it's hurt, it hurt our fraternity for a generation. Or two. We notice, huh? Or two. You could or arguably two. say two, right? right? Absolutely. But what we notice is those grandfathers and grandmothers and all that, they take care of the grandchildren, and you see more times than none a lot of the the lessons and the stuff that the grandchildren teach fall into or into the grandparents teach fall into the grandchildren right. and then they are more interested i mean i'm a first generation for, uh freemason right and with that i'm also you know my grandfather wasn't a freemason he was an odd fellow you know i mean my grandfather was a pretty interesting socialite 
him and his wife, him and my grandmother were in Finley. I mean, my grandfather created the police shield for Finley. This is amazing. I'm going to put that up yeah. here. Yeah. And with who, who does that? Of, like, uh, yeah, my grandpa designed the, the police shield for a, a, a city. Yeah. He worked for Eastern Kodak and all that stuff in their securities and yeah. a whole other story. And he was an interrogator in World War II uh, and the Korean War. And he's got a couple of medals. And it's amazing. Yeah, it was really cool. Is he still around? Is he still hanging out? No, 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 no. My grand, my dad was a war convention baby, so like, oh. all of his, all of his siblings were like eighteen when he was born. So his grandpa, you know, my grandpa had a little bit of too much scotch with his <laughs> grandmother, and <laughs> hey, my, uh, grand, my and then yeah. So I didn't yeah. even force him to get to meet a guy. Like no, that. Um, yeah. What's What's interesting is you meet, you know, and a lot of I've talked to a lot of our brother, you know. Yeah. My dad wasn't amazing, but my grandfather was. I saw his chest and I saw his knickknacks. Right. And I heard the stories and all mm. this other stuff, and it got me excited. Mm-hmm. And I think what's beautiful about our fraternity, and I don't want to segue. No, dude, we're doing whatever we want. It's fine. Talk, is uh, you don't get instant gratification in this fraternity. No. You work in it. You're a part of it. You apply it to your life to be a good person. Mm-hmm. You bring faith back into your life and you try to be a, a better person out in the community to help your fellow man right and i think especially during these times of covid where i know everything about people on their facebook i know when their birthday is i know everything it's these genuine connections in the fraternity our friendship mm-hmm. our brotherhood right in the fraternity that brings us closer because as you get older, you don't meet people like this, like non-Masons, you know? You might join a spin class. And you might join a dance class. You might meet a couple, couple of years. This is a place. This is that think tank where we can talk about ideas and we can, you know, explore, you know, the uh, explore all these different realms of study and faith and theology and the symbolisms in our fraternity. And it brings us closer because... I went through the same experience you went. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. No, totally. I mean, I mean, that's a big, that's a really big deal. You know, a lot of people that talk about the been in the military. I mean, it's kind of a thing that they go through. It's like, you know, they've, they can speak to each other on a level that we can't because they've experienced the thing, but we can speak to each other on a level that we can because we've gone through the same thing that we've experienced together. Totally. And, and, you know, it, it, that's a missing part of, um, a lot of people's experience. Not that it's missing. I mean, I mean, you can go through life and entirely just completely fine and deal with what you're doing with every day and, 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 and not, and not feel that. But I, you know, and you have, have, have gone through this experience and as Masons and we can, we can come to each other on a level and understand that, you know, um, I can say some of the most outlandish shit that you're ever going to hear that I feel, and I'm not going to be judged by you. Right. I mean, you maybe, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, not in a way that never. you're never going to talk to me again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you meet guys from, I mean, we're not that far in age, but you and I, we've met so many guys from different ages and you're sitting around a table and it, the age gap doesn't come into play. No. Yeah. I know what's just kind of amazing. Everybody's like, we well, no one's to see Mason. He's like, well, I'm sitting next to the guy who's, you know, Robbie, Robert Lee Franks, the third right here next to my right. And I got another guy here who is 98 years old, was in, was in the world war two, was in the Korean war, you know, uh, 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 raised four kids, has 15 grandkids, you know, has lived his entire life. And, and, and right next to him is his son who's 65 and has done all those same things too. And then, then his grandkids there. And then, you know, there's another guy that, you know, we just met down the road who races motorcycles or whatever. And he's a really cool dude. And we all have a lot to say and nobody judges each other. Nobody says that your point is invalid or, or whatever you're saying is good, is bad or good. And we're all equal. Absolutely. And what we also are, we're in this, this, we're in this realm of a fraternity where there's so much history, there's so much symbolism, there's so many lessons and principles and studies and allegories where you're just scratching the surface on some of this stuff. That can be a lifelong journey to apply to your, to, to apply into your life. 
Would you see that thing? I'm sorry. It just, I it saw just it, got, yeah. it. just got bigger. I, was, I, did, I knew me. I saw that. that. I saw it. Was probably oh, was just, you know, he's like, get back on point. <laughs> no, fucking, fucking yeah. You know, I was trying to actually switch it. I, I didn't want to fuck with that guy anymore. Yeah. You know, but here's what Crowley does. Crowley is, again, that that carnival barker into mm-hmm. the unknown. Join with me into the Twilight Zone. Let me show you what I see, what I, you know, what I've experienced. I am all, I am knowing I yeah. am a prophet for the new eon and I'm bringing the anti-Christianity. Mm-hmm. But you see a trail of tears. You see literally body counts of all these people he destroyed. Ruined lives, his own children. Ruined lives. Yeah, everything. Wives, lovers, concubines, devout followers. I mean, people died in the Abbey of Philema by drinking cat's blood in the water and got typhoid and <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. people were cutting themselves every time they said I, you know, because that was into his mind a sin. Right. And, and he used these platforms of AA and OTO to promote his uh, his faith and what his, his religion, what he was trying to create. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing, you know, with Led Zeppelin and all these musicians and even in some Masonic authors. You notice, uh, you know, they like to quote Crowley, probably to fill a lackluster book with some, to add some fluff to the content, you know, and people say there's gold in the ashes. Really? I think it's just ashes sometimes. Yeah. Maybe those ashes are just golden. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) I doubt it, but to each their own, you know, and no, for one thing I implore, you know, Masonry doesn't teach us to look into Crowley. No. Like, again, we said it in the beginning of this of this story. Crowley was not a Mason. There was is not no record evidence that he was ever a Freemason. No. And why do we study this, John? He, in, in your opinion, I'll let you speak. Why do we study this? Well, I think he, we... He, Crowley specifically... Well, yeah. Why would we? Why would we be dwelling on a guy like Crowley? Oh, I, uh, I, well, I think it's because in 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 any type of esoterica, um, or the unknown, or the or the secret of the mystery, you're going to start um, creating associations that don't exist. So, um. Oh, uh, Crowley was this guy and he was mysterious and he, you know, he was this, this whatever magician and he was the devil and he was reincarnated on earth and all this shit. And he was this, but oh, isn't that what the Freemasons are? Isn't that what the Rosicrucians are? Isn't that what, uh, the Egyptian mystery schools are? Isn't that, you know, it's like you, you've got to be able to be educated enough to say when somebody comes to you and says, well, you're a Freemason, aren't you part of the Illuminati and, and you guys worship Aleister Crowley and you have sex magic and slit goats throats. It's like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> this, is, this is, this is not anything that we're anywhere close to being. And this is, you know, this is, uh, let me, let me explain to you what this charlatan was and what we really are and what we really do. And I think that's what, um, for me anyway, it was, it, it, you need to have all the information you possibly can have to be educated enough to, to help people understand that, um, y- you know, that you are not part of that, um, disparate, um, uh, piece of crap yeah, <laughs> that I think, that, I think that is, gotta, right? I think you got to know the quote unquote enemy. Oh yeah. Know your enemy. You know, uh, Mike Lake, one of a great guy. Mike Lake, I, Mike Lake, I hope you see this. I, I hope that uh, we did you some justice yeah, on, on some of this. And, and Mike Lake, I, I hope you come on and talk to us. Yeah, Mike Lake, you know, he he took he did a lecture for us on Crowley and went right down the line. Mike Mike Lake took like, us by his hand, took us by the hand, and put us in in a spot where we could eloquently and um, uh, uh, speak about Crowley in a way that doesn't disparage our current fraternal obligations or um, affiliations and, and and a way to help us. You know, what, what do you want to say, Robbie? Help us like gauge the waters that we're in. It was just like, you got to understand what you're talking about. He's a very controversial figure. 
You don't want to be spouting who Crowley is and what he's about and all this stuff. You got to know him. You have to understand the history of his life to know the the bullshit and mm-hmm. where he takes creative licenses to accentuate his lifestyle and what he was trying to do. And right. I think there's. I think that you use that as a tool for anything. So you just don't blindly follow somebody. Crowley was not like. Manly P. Hall. He wasn't right. like Alistair. Uh, Alistair. He wasn't like Albert Pike. Yeah. You know. Yeah. He's a whole nother animal, and he's not in the best of life, especially if you talk about him in Masonic circles. So understand the enemy to you know defend yourself when people and guard against it. Yeah, guard against that bullshit. Yeah, and guard against it. Yeah, because yeah, like you said, if you're going to be an author and you're going to drop a bunch of shit about Crowley. And you're gonna cite him and things like that, and you're gonna, you know, and and put yourself out there, and then have the understanding of the knowledge and the wherewithal to know that the two don't intermix. Absolutely, and uh, I think you got, and Crowley's just the example of other things that are, you know, like OTO's not Masonic. No. You know, it might have been brought upon by a by a German Mason or whatnot, but it's not. Masonic. It's not part of the Masonic branches. They're their own Wicca, witchcraft, Offshoot. magic, energy, bullshit that what they are. That's what and, they are. And that's cool if that's what you want to be. Just be that, but just Yeah, that's that. cool. Yeah. If you enjoy if you enjoy doing that stuff, that's fantastic. Perfect. But, it, but it's different from like, you know, like what we study in in Rosicrucianism and what we study in Freemasonry, right. Knights Templar, and any other stuff that you're involved in on the Masonic family. Right. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. Yeah. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, Majorowski, what the fuck are you talking about? How does this have anything to do with UFOs? But I think it has a lot to do with UFOs. Because UFOs are basically a study of yourself. Um and the collective consciousness and what you believe to be real in the respect of your own uh, mind. And, and mind is not the best word because the mind is all, right? Well, it's the general field, right? Like right. You're creating an organization where you're not only just going to have the supernatural, which deals with the aliens and mythos and stuff like that, you're also looking to bring it shed light on the paranormal and the occult and the esoteric and the esoteric yeah. side of things. And it's all, it's all intermix. It's the, it's the same thing Yeah, in my mind. Anyway, it's being the light. And right. I think you do a great job and you're putting it on the level for everybody to see, you know? And mm-hmm. I know you were telling me about some exciting stuff coming up about UFOs and he wanted to take this time to, uh, go into who Crowley was because it is an interesting topic and you can talk about this and was he visited or talking to something, an alien or an extraterrestrial or an interdimensional being and so forth. Well, how do you know? I mean, but there's no, you know, I mean, I think that all of it, somehow all of the disparate things that have existed through humanity have somehow slowly crept into a point where it's all, it's all the same thing. It's all uh, humans experiencing uh, things that they can you, you cannot put to words or have a context for because it hasn't it, it hasn't been a part of the collective consciousness. Yeah, yeah, very you well know. said. Honestly, I mean, it, it feels like you know if I mean honestly, if you and I sit get together and we draw a big salt circle on the ground and 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 have some type of yeah, magic Am I cir- in the salt circle, John? I, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to, yeah. No, no, You're I not going to annoy Bird me? No, 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 I'm not going to annoy I promise. <laughs> never, never, ever. Never, ever. Uh, no, man. I think what you got here is something truly special. You oh, know? stop um, it. And I think you're, you know, this is what you've been wanting to do. And you got. Well, you found very- me, Robbie. That's how it worked. Yeah, that's how it worked. And um, I really appreciate this time just being on your on your YouTube channel and doing this. Like, no, this man, I cool. appreciate you. Honestly, I, I couldn't do it without you and, and, and our other brothers to, 
you know, I, I tell you guys some weird shit all the time, and nobody goes, fuck, Majorowski's just gone. <laughs> yeah, nobody does that in our, yeah. in our little book club. No, you no. Know, we, but got you, some, we got some great guys. Uh, yeah. I hope you're going to get on. No, oh, yeah. No, I, in the future because guys – buckle up i mean this is the first show it's only going to get better it's going to get and i hope you're along with me the whole time robbie because i I will come on anytime i really want to do us thing i know you are ufo but i really would like to do something on mormonism and joseph smith oh yeah well it ties in now mormonism and joseph smith ties into the whole ufology thing because they they believe that there's other entities on other planets and that that aliens exist and that's part of their mythos and you know some of the other stuff that uh, that I'm involved in as well. <laughs> and I have some different <laughs> range of topics that uh, I would love just to speak with you on. Um, yeah. In no. And, I mean, literally, we've almost been going two hours now. Yeah. No, I think we can go another two. It'd be fine. <laughs> so at, dude, some point, mean, at some point, at some point, I have to pee. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but uh, dude, I really appreciate the time being. No, on, I, I appreciate. Uh, I love you, brother. Honestly, I love you, and uh, I honestly think this has been a, a, an amazing time. I, I think we can uh, in, honestly do another f- three, four hours. I think we can do this every day, and uh, and still, you know, if people watch it, that's cool. I think if people get into it, I think if other Masons get into it, that's great. I think if people that are interested in Masonry, maybe a little bit of just our interaction and our camaraderie, you know, and our in our, in our brotherhood and, and uh, some of our um, you know tenants and. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know this. Like, I, like I'm no author, at least not yet. I'm no, you know, orator on this kind of topic. We're just friends, and we were just having a conversation. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's a great story of how <laughs> we're gonna leave that story alone about uh, Crowley and the conversation that was had about who he was on um, on a level with a certain author. But we'll leave that alone for another day. <laughs> and moving forward. You got some great content, and I'm always a phone call away to talk to you about any of this. I would love to be on here again. Oh no, you're going to be on here again. You're going to be you're going to be on here all the time. I appreciate it. I really do. Uh, I owe you um, a huge debt of gratitude for um, believing me, believing me, and enough to bring me into um, you know your circle. I mean. Um, I appreciate that. I, uh, I you're going to have my, you're going to have the titles down on the list, right? We're just going to, we're going to have to, ha- it's going to gonna have, have to a- scroll to the, <laughs> <laughs> it's just two, gonna be an two hours is going to be Robert Lee Franks, the third, blah, 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 Put blah, some blah, Easter eggs in there. Put like America's sweetheart, the bold oh, yeah. and the beautiful, you the know, just the be- little- yeah, just, just dump it, just dump it in there. Just every once in a while, just highlight it above your head. There you go. The Honestly, amount, you're you're gonna have to type it out for me because I don't even know. I'll I'll be more than happy to do that. There's a know? lot of there's a lot. You got of some editing ahead of you, bro. There's a lot of editing. Some, there's plus, a lot. Of, no, I I, 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 I might just say fuck it and just keep it. <laughs> <laughs> just keep it. Hey, later. you're not out here being Joe Rogan. You're just no. doing what you love. You I'm know just, what I I'm mean? I'm just having like, fun talking to my buddy. It could be me, and it could be me, you, and two. Uh, and two high schoolers watching <laughs> stoned out of their mind. And you and I seriously just here talking about all the stuff that we've learned. So. That's cool. You know, we're building our own Crowley base. At one point, somebody's <laughs> going to look back and be like, the night of 11-20-20, Robert Lee Franks III and John Majorowski got onto a podcast. Exactly. They you know, set forth gonna- the end of the world. Exactly. You know, hey, dude, I'm excited for what it is. Stick with this guy, man. He's got some really great uh, content coming up. Mm. I'm really looking forward to you getting uh, some of our uh, fellow brethren on here as guest speakers because they're going to be able to or, you know, talk to you about some wide range subjects. And John's got some great stuff for um, for on the level uh, on the ufology realm. But you know, uh, if I may. Yes, you may guys, any, anytime, Rob. Be, well, hey, feel free to find me on Facebook on Robert Lee Franks the Third. My uh, Twitter handle is RL Franks III, and uh, I just would love to speak to people. Don't bash me. I mean, you know, give me constructive. Be criticism. nice. It's be gonna nice. be. It's gonna get better. But uh, <laughs> this is the first one. Literally, this we don't is know the first what we're doing. One. We don't know what we're doing. I love I you, John. What we're doing. I love you too. I, we're gonna put all that stuff on there. We're gonna put it in the in the comments. We're gonna put it on the thing. You know, we're gonna make it happen. And, and you know, and and honestly, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and we're you. like, I, I think it's, I think we're just create an open thing where we can just talk. If you guys want to say something cool, be constructive, be, be, uh, you know, be helpful, help the conversation along. And, uh, you know, we all, we're all going to do this together. Yeah. And he's looking forward to hearing from you guys. I'm looking so, forward to hearing from you more. Hey, just a phone call. What You know, we talk. And when we talk, we talk for hours on the phone about oh, a wide yeah. range of stuff. So, I know it. brother, I'm looking forward to the journey. I'm glad I'm on the journey. And until the next time. I love you, Robert Franks. The third. I love you. Take care, Johnny. Bye-bye, Bye. Ryan.